a short depth front IO server with a huge CPU, up to five different types of storage and even 10 G base T networking built in. This ASUS server has a bunch of features that we haven't seen before, so let's take a look. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the ASUS EG500E11. Now, if you read the STH main site, you might have seen a review of this a little while ago when this was still a very pre-production server. I first saw the server at Supercomputing 2022. That was before the Sapphire Rapid Xeon was even launched and this was obviously a server that I wanted to go take a look at. I do just wanna point out that we're gonna say that ASUS is sponsoring this video because they sent the server that we could use to go and do this review on. And they also sent it before this was the final version of the server. So there may be a little bit of tweaks and stuff before you actually see the real version get out. But I was told that this is pretty darn close to the production version. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, let's start with this side of the server first. And the first feature I wanna point out is the fact that, uh, well, you get two NVMe hot swap bays. You can see you just kind of pop a drive out and all of a sudden you're ready to go. There are two of these here and these are NVMe drives. So you can get some pretty decent storage even for a short depth chassis. On the other side, you get USB 3 ports as well as your VGA ports. If you wanna hook a KVM like cart or something like that up to this, you can totally go do that. The rest of this though is totally dedicated to these fans. And these fans are really there to go and pull a whole bunch of air through the chassis. But that brings us to perhaps one of the most interesting things about this. You'll see that we don't have rack ears on this, even though that's where our hot swap two and a half inch bays are because this is actually the back of the server. And so flipping it around, you can see that we have our rack ears now and we have other features that you would normally expect to be on the rear of a server. We're gonna explain why in a bit, but let's kind of go through what's here. So the first thing you're gonna see is that we have our power supplies. Now, of course, these are hot swap power supplies, so you can just kind of slide them out, no problem. And these are 650 watt max units. Now on the bottom of this, we get what would normally be our rear IO, but instead it's, I guess, our front IO. We have a management port, we have two 10 G based T ports that are based on the Intel X710 NIC, which is in this heat sink inside the chassis. And just to kind of give you an idea, the X710 is a relatively new 10 G based T NIC. So it's actually pretty cool that ASUS has it here. We also get another set of VGA as well as USB 3 ports. And then we also get a, another port, which I didn't know what it was because these aren't labeled on this pre-production version, but it's actually a serial console port. Now the other features are pretty normal on this. You get a dual slot PCIe Gen 5 by 16 thing that you could run either a single card that's dual with or you could run two single width cards. And then you have another PCIe slot that's in this middle part. And then there's the other feature, which are these right here. Now these are actually EDSFF bays. So these are the new E1S bays that if you wanna go put E1S storage, you totally can. Okay, that was just a lot of fun for a lot of the long-term STH YouTube viewers. When I used to go and hold the servers up and just kind of show people, them, I just kind of felt like doing it because this is so small that I actually can do it with the server. But instead, let's take a look inside the server because you're gonna see how this thing is made and some of the other really cool features that are inside. So the first thing you're gonna notice when you look inside the system is that there is an airflow guide. And this is the airflow guide. It's actually a pretty hard plastic, which is nice. A lot of the One U servers don't have these hard plastic things. So that is something nice that Asus gives you. But with that off, we can see a ton of really cool features inside. So let's start with the storage. Now we talked about how you have a dual two and a half inch and those are NVMe bays, which are up here, which are on the rear of the chassis. You also have our EDSFF E1S drives, which are on the, I guess what would be the front of the chassis. And then you could also, I guess, put AIC, so add in cards for you know your PCIe slots and get storage that way. And all three of these, you can put two drives at least, which gives you some kind of redundancy in RAID 0 or whatever. Now you might be thinking three different types of storage. Well, that's a lot and it is, except for the fact that it's, it's nowhere near the number of storage options that you have in here where you can put two in, you can actually put two SATA SSDs. There's this little tiny internal base slot thing and it's not a hot swap thing or anything like that because it's like definitely inside the server, but I guess Asus was like, hey, we got a little extra room. Let's go throw some SATA SSDs in there. So that's exactly what they did. I was totally shocked when we saw this thing. The other cool one though, is that there's a dual M.2 slot riser. So there's this little riser that pops out, it's toolless, and you can go put two M.2 drives in there. So that gives you a total of five different dual storage options. Insane in a small little chassis like this. 
But a lot of storage, of course, is cool, except for the fact that you, you need a good processor in a chassis like this. Now, there are a whole bunch of different options when you get to these kind of systems that really feel like that edge market, maybe like, you know, telco edge, like if you have a closet or something like that, where you want like all the front IO instead of rear IO. And so that's a pretty common requirement for folks. And that's why these systems are made. But for some folks, you know, the Atom C3000 series, the P5000 series, like those are just not enough for, you know, what you need. There's also things like the Intel Xeon 1700 and 2700 series, which we have another video on. And those also, uh, you know, those are still kind of older generation Ice Lake D cores, so they're not the brand new Sapphire Rapids. And so that's why we have a server like this. This has a full Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapids CPU in it, as well as a total of eight DDR5 DRAM channels. Now, if you want to learn about DDR5 RDIMMs versus UDIMMs and the consumer memory, all that kind of stuff, we have another video on that that we'll link in the description. But the key thing by far is that not only do you get a massive amount of memory bandwidth with a total of eight DDR5 DIMMs, but you also get the Sapphire Rapid Xeon. Now the Sapphire Rapid Xeons are exciting because well, you get cores and cores are always fun and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't necessarily go look and you know try putting like a 350 watt CPU or something like that in there because I think that's just a little bit too much for a system like this. But on the other hand, there are a lot of SKUs that have things like Intel Quick Assist technology built in. You can get 800 gigabits per second of Intel Quick Assist compression and also encryption on a CPU that's a built-in accelerator without having to use the PCIe slots. We did a piece on this last year, so you can go check that out. We'll again link that in the description, but that's a massive amount of acceleration, one. And two, you can get a lot of cores and you can get a lot of memory, a lot of memory bandwidth. I mean, this is a high performance server. And before we get to the performance section, I just wanna point out real quick that the cooling on this is really interesting as well. You'll see up top in the middle of the chassis, we get two dual fan modules. And then in the middle of the chassis, we get another four dual fan modules. We get a single fan here because that's all they could fit. And then the bottom portion where the SATA drives are and the power supplies, those are cooled by the power supply fans. And I know somebody is gonna wonder, can you relocate the rack gears? And it looks like there are another set of holes, although I'm not 100% sure if you can, but there are another set of holes. And it looks like you can go and reconfigure the rack gears with three screws to go from here to the back of the system. And of course, there's always rails and stuff like that if you want as well. With that, let's get to the performance. Okay, so for this, we actually used an Intel Xeon Gold 6438M. To me, that's a fascinating processor because it has a 205 watt TDP, which is of course more than some of the older generation processors, but it's also more cores than you get in something like a Skylake or Cascade Lake system. And especially more cores in like that 205 watt TDP, which was like the maximum of those generations of servers. So anything like pre-Ice Lake, you get like the same TDP, but you get 32 cores instead of only like 28, and you get higher performance cores, you get more memory bandwidth, all those kind of features, and PCIe Gen 5, which is of course one of the huge features here. And to me, this Intel Xeon and gold CPU is also really interesting just with the comparison to AMD because we get our eight memory channels, we still get our PCIe Gen 5 and we get 32 cores. And until, you know, AMD Sienna was really out there, I mean, this is gonna be the fastest 32 core processor you can really get in that 205 watt TDP range. Intel has not just their high end, like, you know, four die Sapphire Rapids, like solutions and stuff like that for like, you know, like the higher end chips, but it also has a monolithic die that it uses for what I think would be really good in this server and it lowers the latency on the chip and all that kind of stuff. So it's overall a pretty good thing, lower power and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's what this whole system is designed for. And so when we took a look at this compared to like a 2U single socket server, where you have tons of room for a heatsink. Well, we got performance that was pretty darn close. Now remember that this is running these things at 100%. If you're running at like 50%, you're not gonna notice a difference between the two CPUs because you're just not generating enough power and heat to really make the CPU work or anything like that. And by the way, the vast majority of servers do run at well under 70% load. And so basically most folks aren't gonna notice the difference between this and like a 2U single socket server. And I think a big part of that is just this giant heatsink thing that we have here. And you see that there's like this heatsink, plus there's like these like dog ears or wings or whatever the heck you wanna call it, where you have this just giant block of heatsink that's not sitting over the CPU at all. This is a common thing that we're seeing on more and more servers today. And it's definitely being taken advantage of in this server. And the key thing about this performance, of course, is the fact that you are talking about something that's like two X's fast 
fast as what you would get in the Xeon D2700 series. So this is a pretty decent option and there are other options that Intel and Asus have as well. And before we get done with this section, I just wanna show you, here's the quick topology map. So you can kind of see what the system looks like from a topology perspective. It's pretty simple since we have a single socket CPU plus we have our PCA, but everything is ultimately connected to a single CPU, which makes the topology relatively straightforward. Okay, now let's talk about the power in a system like this. Now we definitely have the fans going. So we saw the idle power consumption was anywhere from maybe that like 80 watt range to 110, 120 watts, kind of depending on what OS was in there and also like, you know, what the configuration was. We actually, of course, always test this for performance reasons. Like we always fill up the memory channels when we test this, but we just kind of have this because uh, it's how Asus actually sent it, but still a full configuration figure 80 to maybe 110, 120 watts. Now on the maximum side, you're gonna see power consumption in this kind of like base CPU plus memory configuration of somewhere in that like 320 to 350 watts. Now, of course, you can go up a lot from there. And so if you're doing some kind of like 5G networking application or something like that, where you need to go and have like an FPGA and like you want a GPS timing and all that kind of stuff, you can do that in here, but that is of course going to raise the power consumption. Still, given the fact that we have redundant power supplies and we're only using about half of the power supply capacity with our kind of base CPU and memory and like all that kind of stuff, Stuff, I think there's actually a lot here to go and put additional add-in cards. So if you want to, that's totally an option. Okay, if you can't tell, I think this is a super fun server, but I always like to have some kind of key lessons learned. And to me at least, I think the key lesson learned is that we always kind of talk about how much power the fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable Sapphire Rapids chips use, especially when you have like those four dies going all that. We also did a Xeon Max article recently. I mean, that thing uses a lot of power. So I think that, you know, when we look at the high end, the Intel Xeon CPUs are using a lot of power. What I think is really interesting is that this is something that is like kind of a step or two above what you would get in like an Ice Lake D type system. But at the same time, you could do things like you can take advantage of the onboard accelerators in Sapphire Rapids. You also can get much higher core counts and you can just get a higher TDP, which means that you get more performance out of those newer cores. And then also let's not forget that Ice Lake was a DDR4 part and this is a DDR5 part. So you just get a lot more memory bandwidth as is. And so one of the reasons that when I saw this at Supercomputing 2022, I was so excited is because this server is really kind of like, well, if you had something that you were gonna put a Xeon D in, but maybe Xeon D just wasn't fast enough and you just needed more performance. You need like the ability to configure things easily without having like a soldered on CPU or something like that. And you just wanted more expandability with like PCIe Gen 5 and like all those kind of features. Well, this is exactly that system. Now, is this gonna replace one new dual socket servers for everybody? Absolutely not. But I think for folks that do have those edge use cases, this is pretty awesome. I also just think it's super fun. The fact that there are five different storage options where you can put at least two of the same types of drives. You can do add-in cards, you can do two and a half inch NVMe, two and a half inch SATA, EDSFF as well as M.2. And I mean, what other kind of server has all of those different configuration options? Now, one piece of feedback that we definitely delivered as part of our STH main site review. And if you wanna see just kind of more information, definitely go check out that main site review. We'll of course link that in the description, but the big piece of feedback I thought that this needed was just a little bit better documentation. There are things like on the rear ports, they weren't labeled yet. And so like I was doing things like, and we were in the lab, like trying to figure out how to get the management port to work. And then we realized that it was actually a serial console port. And so like, those are the types of things that like, you know, just would be nice if all of the ports were labeled. And that's just a small thing. On the other hand, this is a pre-production server so hopefully they fix that when it goes into production. Still, I just love these kind of systems where they're just like so crammed and just so different than a lot of the large, you know, two U dual socket, one U dual socket, two U four node, like all these like kind of servers that we've seen a bunch of. I just love these little edge platforms where people are just doing fun things. And this certainly has a lot of fun things going on. Hey guys, I hope you liked this look at the Asus EG500 E11 server. This is an awesome little edge server. And I hope you like looking at all the fun little features. And if you did, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give this video a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications. So you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.